Just like you, though, I am a primary care clinician first, and I provide uh, treatment and management for patients with the same, of all ages, of different genders, for the same conditions that are being presented here today. So then why am I up here talking about IUDs at a cardiometabolic risk conference? And the reason is, as a women's health expert, and as a contraceptive expert, I take care of a lot of women of reproductive age and helping them prevent unintended pregnancies. Unfortunately, I spend a lot more time than I would like helping manage patients with unintended pregnancies. And a lot of those women come to me who have a lot of significant cardiovascular mor morbidities. And they were told by their primary care provider or their specialist that where there are certain contraceptive methods that would have been very safe and effective for them to use, that they couldn't use it. So I've tried to make it my professional mission to go out and preach to my fellow primary care providers on the latest evidence about the safety and efficacy of different contraceptives in the hopes of helping reduce unintended pregnancy. And I'm very fortunate, I have several of my disciples, my former residents who are all over the country doing the same, some of them are actually here in the audience today. So uh, I do have one disclaimer, I teach a FDA required training course, any of you who have provided contraceptive implants know that it's a requirement, so that is my only disclosure. You can thank me later though for insisting that we did include brand names in my slides so you don't have to keep looking up Hippocrates to figure out what is he talking about. Thank you. So, in the next 20 minutes that I usually have an hour for, I'm not going to stand up here and expect you to walk out saying, I'm ready, willing, and able to start inserting IUDs. Please, if you've not been trained, don't start doing that. But what I do hope to do is, one, to convince you that unintended pregnancy is not just a major public health problem in this country, but it's relevant to patients in your practice, and to convince you to start assessing pregnancy intention as a vital sign for all of your reproductive age women, especially those at cardiovascular risk. Number two, please, please, please help me dispel myths about safety and efficacy of IEDs that are not only perpetuated by the lay public, but even our fellow clinicians. And number three, I want to help actually let you leave here with a, a real practical point of care tool that you can go in, into your practices and start using to help guide your patients, not only who have cardiovascular risk factors, but other medical conditions about what is the best fit for them for effective and safe contraception. So unless you've been sleeping under a rock this past year, I think you know about the heavy, intense, controversial debate about repeal and replace Obamacare, right? Can I get an amen? Everybody heard about it? Okay. But I want to tell you, from a standpoint of especially women, the Affordable Care Act has done a lot of great things. One of which is required all insurance companies to cover all types of contraception free of cost, in other words, without copay. Now, certain companies have found loopholes to get excused from that. Some insurance companies, unfortunately the ones that take care of our poorest patients, like Medicaid, are requiring something called buy and bill, where the practice has to lay out the money and then get reimbursed. But for the most part, it has improved access and use of effective means of contraception for at least our insured patients. Unfortunately, our uninsured are still falling through the cracks. And at no time in history have we had more contraceptive options available to our patients. And this list keeps growing every year. And because of that, we now have the lowest rates of adolescent pregnancy in this country. And, th and that's not from abstinence only. And we have had some decrease in overall pregnancy rates. This used to, number used to be 50% if I was giving this talk six years ago. But I think you'd still argue that 40% of pregnancy being unintended is still significant. Now you might argue, well some of those are just missed time. You know, I wanted to get married first, I wanted to go on that trip around the world, we wanted to buy a house first. But look at this. This rate has decreased from 50%, but still 40% of those pregnancies were not just missed time, they were unwanted. And result and 40% of unintended pregnancies still result in elective abortion. That doesn't include miscarriage or spontaneous abortion. And I'm not here to have the, discuss about that controversy, but from a medical standpoint, a public health standpoint, I think you'd agree that this is still a very significant public health problem. I think most dis disturbing is then when you look at women who had an unintended pregnancy and you interview them, their previous three months they were using an FDA-approved method of contraception. Were they lying? No. What they found is they weren't using it either properly 
or they weren't using it consistently. And I know it's easy to point a finger and say, come on, guy, how hard is it to take a pill? Well, I'll tell you, it isn't easy, guys, because we took our male medical students, we had them put 28 M&Ms in a bottle, we had them take one every day, and we looked at how many were left in the bottle at the end of the month, and thank God men can't get pregnant. <laughs> it's actually very hard to prevent unintended pregnancy, because women have about 360 chances to get pregnant if you look at reproductive age, 15 to 44, and that, rate's even, that age is even getting expanded. So depending on how many children she wants, we can have a significant, significant challenge trying to help a woman prevent pregnancy. So how do we help these patients so they don't wind up like her? Well, I'm on the pill, I also use the diaphragm with a contraceptive sponge, Alan wears a condom, plus we can stay completely from sex. <laughs> and the answer is long-acting reversible contraception, or LARC for short. That means includes IUDs and the contraceptive implant. And it's not just me standing up saying this, American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of Pediatrics, and ACOG all agree that LARC methods should be used first line for most women, including adolescents and women who have never been pregnant. Why? Because it has have the greatest evidence that they have a significant impact on reducing unintended pregnancy. And why is that so? Because as we say in New Jersey, it's contraception you can forget about. Because just like my earlier speaker stole the line from me, you can insert it and forget it. Patients don't have to remember to take a pill every day, to put a patch on every week, to put a ring in their vagina every month, to come to the doctor every three months for a shot. They provide effective contraception from three to ten or more years, depending on which LARC method that they choose. And not only is it their duration that makes them so great, it's that their effectiveness is so great. The leave and adjustable IUD and the contraceptive implant, hint, hint, pretest question, um, are, just a, are more effective than even female sterilization over the first year of use. And a copper ID is comparable as a reversible method to permanent method of contraception. And their typical use, because patients don't have to do anything, is the same as ideal use. Now, you might look and a patient might say, well, I understand if I, the average woman forget, misses a pill one or two times a month, and it's usually the worst time when they're supposed to start their new pill pack. And I could live with an 8% failure rate. But remember, this is first year of use, one year. It's multiplied. If she wants to delay pregnancy over three years, is she going to be comfortable with a potential of a 24% failure rate? And what's nice about the LARC methods is it doesn't change over their years of duration. The other thing is when you look at real world data, women are more likely to continue their LARC method than the pill, the patch, the ring, or injection. And, you, and this is true for one-year continuation and three-year continuation rates that there's excellent evidence for. And you might say, well, is it really cost-effective that she only kept her IUD in for a year? But remember, that means that for that year, she had almost 100% effective contraception. And that's why we have seen translation of this in real world to decrease unintended pregnancy. The problem was we haven't been able to translate that all across the country to all of our patients. In fact, if you look at other countries, the average uh, use of IUDs and implants is about 26%. And guess who else in this country uses them that much? Female OBGYNs. But when we look at actual patients, it pales in comparison. Still far and away, number one, it's the pill, followed by a close second, female sterilization. IUDs and implants really have not been adopted like they have everywhere else. Why is that? And let's focus on IUDs. Well, number one, if you didn't get trained on how to insert an IUD in residency, and unlike the implant where there's formal training, you can go to dinners and get trained, there really isn't that available for IUDs. So if you didn't get trained in your residency, you're probably not going to get trained in practice. And consciously or subconsciously, are you really going to recommend something whereas the patient then says yes, and you're like, oh, shit, now i got to remember. Who am I going to refer him to? Well, I have a friend who was an OBGYN, but she trained at a Catholic residency. I'm not sure she learned how to put them in. And I will tell you that studies show that whether it be consciously or subconsciously, if you're not trained to put something in and now you have to make an extra step in terms of finding someone, it's going to make it less likely. And even if you do refer them, 50% drop off once they leave your office of whether they show up to get that done. Number two, just Google IUDs and see what comes up. And you'll see a ton of negative press and negative blogs all about the horrors of IUDs. And this misinformation 
is not only, again, perpetuated online by lay people and organizations with secondary gain, but also by our fellow clinicians. Also, a lot of clinicians are scared to get trained because they say, well, if I put it in and I perforate a patient, I'm going to get sued. Well, first of all, perforation rates are extremely low, one in a thousand to one in two thousand. And you know how you manage a patient with a perforation? You manage them in the office. You monitor their blood pressure for a half hour, put them on an antibiotic, and you bring them back four to six weeks later and re-attempt to put the IUD in. The real other problem, though, is upfront costs. Most insurances, you can order their IUD or implant, and they will ship it to you at no cost to you, and you insert it. But more and more insurances, especially our Medicaid ones, are requiring that you spy and stock that IUD, which some of them are very expensive, and then you have to submit and hope your colleague didn't forget to check off the J code to get reimbursed. And so that's been, a, I think, a real barrier. But the point is, with all of these other barriers, what happens is women are not being made aware. You don't see a lot of commercials. There's a few now but you don't see a lot of direct-to-consumer advertising, and women, again, are overwhelmed with negative things that they hear from their friends, and so they're not even aware that this may be a good fit for them. So let me help dispel a couple myths. Number one, you, we may differ. The FDA says life begins at implantation. You and your, and your patients may say, no, it, believe, it, it starts at conception. That's okay, because guess what? IUDs prevent egg and sperm from meeting. There is no conception. How do I know this? Because IUDs don't cause ectopic pregnancies. In fact, they significantly reduce the risk of ectopic pregnancies. Because why? Because they prevent egg and sperm from meeting. That is why if you have a patient who has an ectopic history or they're at risk and they don't want to be pregnant, you should offer IUDs as an excellent method to reduce ectopic. That would not be the case if they didn't work that way. If they affected implantation, they would increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. They do not cause PID. They do not prevent PID. But when you compare to other methods over their three to five to 10 year lifespan, you do not see significant increases in PID. Yes, if you insert an IUD when a woman has chlamydia or gonorrhea on their cervix, you can push it up into the uterus. So yes, you test the patient at the time of insertion. But other than that, you will not increase their risk for PID. It absolutely does not increase the risk of future pregnancies. In fact, the opposite is the problem. They are rapidly reversible. So if you're going to remove an IUD, your patient should leave with one of three things. A new IUD, another effective form of contraception, or prenatal vitamins. Because basically, when they leave that room, they are no longer protected against contraception. They are rapidly reversible. So a patient who wants to get pregnant, that's a good thing. If she doesn't, it may not be. They are not large in size. They're actually very small, so please, have a, a model of an IUD in a uterus. A patient's assumption of how big their uterus is and that the IUDs are gigantic is very uh, misinformed. So it's nice to have one of the models, but please don't bring in the insertion rod. I had residents who did that. Patient says, I, I can't walk with that thing hanging out inside me. So <laughs> make sure you know which kind of model you're showing. And I think most frustrating, because I have four daughters and they're not having sex till they're 30, but <laughs> women who have never been pregnant, three of my daughters are actually IUD users. So it's something I believe in personally. But women who have never been pregnant are often the best candidates for LARC methods, including IUDs. Why? Because they're in college or they're starting new careers. They want to delay pregnancy the longest, and yet they're often told, oh, no, you can't have an IUD. And if I were giving this talk just four years ago, there would only have been two IUDs I could talk about. But Skyla was approved four years ago, uh, Laletta two years ago, and Kylina just last fall. So we now have five contraceptive options for our patients. Four that contain a very low dose of levonorgestrel, a progestin, and one that's non-hormonal, the copper IUD. And remember what I told you, how do they work? They prevent egg and sperm from meeting. Those copper ions in Paragard, the copper not in there like those bracelets on cable TV that give you energy. No, <laughs> the copper's there because the ions kill sperm. The levonorgestrel not only kills sperm, but it creates a mucus plug that prevents sperm from even getting in to the uterus. So again, their primary mechanism is spermicidal. Yes, if you put it in when a patient's about to ovulate or ovulates, it will affect implantation, but that's extremely rare, with the exception maybe of emergency contraception. None of the IUDs work by preventing ovulation, so it's very different than other hormonal types of contraception. I know this is a very busy chart, and I'm sorry I don't have a mouse. I, it's like hemming neglect. I can only point one way or the other or make you really dizzy. But what I tried to do is show you some of the differences between the IEDs. 
For instance, the levonorgestrel IUDs differ by how many milligrams of levonorgestrel they have, and that translates into duration as well as bleeding. And that's what I think is most clinically relevant. They're FDA approved for anywhere from three to 10 years. Um, Liletta just got the approval for four years last week, so you can make that correction in your book. Uh, but I want you to know that we do a lot of things off-label, and there's evidence that you can use Paragard safely up to 12 years, and that you could use the Moreno Aleta up to seven years in most patients. Also, the differences in bleeding are probably what's most clinically relevant to your patients besides duration. There's no hormone in Paragard, so first two or three months they might get some cramping or bleeding, but after that, no effect on their cycles, and the lower doses are more, less likely to cause amenorrhea. Skyla, the lowest, only 6%, Kylena, 12%, but Mirena and Letta, very likely to cause amenorrhea, or certainly significant changes in menstrual cycle for your patients. So how do I make this into plain English for you? Very simple. If you're discussing IUD options with your patient, if they'd rather keep their regular periods and they don't want any hormones, the copper ID might be ideal for them. Their first two or three months, they might have some increased cramping or bleeding. You can give them a non-steroidal, and it usually subsides. However, if you have a patient who already has clinically significant Henry menstrual bleeding or pain, in other words, they miss work or they don't get to go to the Bon Jovi concert because of that, that is a patient who may not be a good candidate for copper IUD. The other thing, though copper IUDs are highly effective for emergency contraception. If you have a patient, you happen to stock it, that's the issue, and she comes in and she's had up to five days of unprotected sex and she's interested in an IUD, you could put it in, highly effective at preventing that pregnancy, and then she can keep it in up to 10 years later. That's pretty rare that you have that scenario, but it is something aware, to be aware of. But another, I think, best kept secret is that the higher dose, the 52 milligram levonorgestrel IUDs, are very effective at reducing heavy menstrual bleeding. So you have a patient who doesn't care if they get a lighter period or they would desire to stop getting their period, the, the Mirena is FDA approved for reducing heavy menstrual bleeding in patients who are considered an IUD. In fact, it's more effective than anything else non-surgical that we keep trying on our patients, and yet people don't, aren't aware that that's an option. Lower dose levonorgestrel IUDs, they might lighten your period, but again, much less likely to cause amenorrhea. So patients who would prefer, even though there's no medical reason, but for cultural other reasons, would still rather get their, um, their cycles every month. So what does this all have to do with me being here at a cardiometabolic conference? And the reason is when you look at certain medical conditions, particularly those being presented here, like diabetes, when you have patients who have micro macrovascular -macro con um, complications, when you have patients who have very high or uncontrolled hypertension, when you have patients who have a history of thromboembolic disease or at high risk, these patients, one of their highest risks for morbidity and mortality for themselves is pregnancy. And one of the highest risks of morbidity and mortality to their fetus is pregnancy. These are patients that unless they want to get pregnant, shouldn't. And I'm not just talking about these patients, even your patients who have well-controlled diabetes, even your patients who have well-controlled hypertension, or obesity with no other risk factors, significantly higher risk of morbidity and mortality with pregnancy. And the recommendation from these, or all these healthcare organizations is you should consider long-acting, highly effective contraception for these patients until or unless they want or are able to get pregnant. And yet I will tell you, the specialists who take care of these patients are often the ones who tell them, you cannot use IUDs or implants. So how do I help guide you, because I'm not going to be there in the office. I, my daughter's a lawyer, but she's not available and probably where you're practicing, to protect you to say, how do I know this is true just because Dr. Levine said it? And this is this pretty color chart. How many of you are familiar with this? And I could tell you by the few hands that went up, unless you just don't like raising your hand, is that this is still one of the best kept secrets. This is created by the Center for Disease Control. It's called the United States uh, Medical Eligibility Criteria for Contraceptive Use. And it's a guide that has the latest evidence for the safety and efficacy of different contraceptive methods based on medical conditions, not just cardiovascular conditions, cancers, or autoimmune disease, what if I have a patient who's breastfeeding, what if I have a patient who just had bariatric surgery, so it has all different conditions and it shows you what is the latest evidence. And all you have to do is Google USMEC and you'll get this beautiful 64 page document that you can read at your leisure. And you look at me like, Dr. Levine, I have more thing, better things to do. Well, if you're like me and you have ADD, go to the bottom and you'll see that there's this full color chart. Get a color printer, print it, and now you have this nice two-page 
color chart, you put it in plastic, that you can use at point of care with your patients. And what it does is it lists different contraceptive methods at the top, and it lists different medical conditions down the vertical side. And for all you millennials, millennials out there, there's an app for it. So there's a free app, just Google CDC contraception. I'm old school, and the reason I like the chart better, it's more visual to show my patients. Because what it does is it uses colors. Green for go, red for no. Why they have pink instead of yellow for caution, I don't know. But it basically, by the change in color, increases what is the risk versus the benefit of using that method. And for those of you who are colorblind, don't worry, it uses one, two, three, four. So let's try to apply this clinically. I have a patient and she's diabetic, but she has bad acne or she has hirsutism. Let's say she has PCOS and she's a diabetic and she wants to use an estrogen containing contraceptive to help her acne and her hirsutism. Can I do it? And the answer is, for the most patients, the answer is absolutely, that you can use estrogen containing contraceptives in your well-controlled diabetics, or even your not well-controlled diabetics, even if they're insulin dependent or non-insulin dependent. When they start developing micro macular vascular complications though, estrogen has been shown to accelerate decline. So in those patients, you do not want to use estrogen containing products. But what, look here, your implant, your copper IUD, your levonorgestrel IUD, all fields of green, it is safe to use. Even your patients who have like end stage renal disease. Now, take that same patient, instead of diabetes, she has hypertension. It's a little different. I can't tell you how many times I've had women who come to me, young women, and they're on a um, blood pressure medicine. And I talk to them, and it seems it temporarily relates to when they were started on an estrogen-containing contraceptive. I stop it, I switch into another method, because pregnancy ain't great for hypertension, and I bring them back, and their blood pressure goes away. Hypertension goes away. Estrogens can raise blood pressure, and be aware of that if you have a patient who suddenly develops elevated blood pressure when they're on estrogen-containing products. That's not to say that if I have a PCOS patient who begs me, because of my hirsutism or my acne, can I please stay on estrogen? Yes, but I follow them much closer. But once you get patients who are on more than one med or they're uncontrolled, you should definitely not be using estrogen because it definitely is going to worsen their blood pressure and increase complications. Whereas again, when you look at the LARC methods, including the levonorgestrel and copper IUD, that's not an issue. This is one that I really like. is one of my biggest pet peeves is I have women who have factor V Leiden mutation, anti-cardiolipin antibody, anti-phospholipin antibody. They come, they have a history of a VTE, either a DVT or pulmonary embolus, and they're told, absolutely, you cannot go on a progestin-containing contraception. And actually, that's not the case. We certainly know you cannot use estrogen in patients who have a history of v VTE because estrogen is prothrombotic. However, you can use leave implants, levonorgestrel IEDs, or copper IEDs in those patients. And in fact, when I have a woman who's on anticoagulation, and her periods are often much heavier because of that anticoagulation, the high-dose levonorgestrel IED might actually help reduce that bothersome side effect of their anticoagulation. So there are very few absolute, the, they put the, uh, for some reason, the relative ones in red. So there's very few absolute or relative contraindications to the IEDs. Most of them are gynecologic, but there aren't cardiovascular conditions for which any of the IEDs are contraindicated or even relatively contraindicated. So why, how do I help you, uh, those of you who aren't going to be putting in IEDs yourselves? I haven't gotten you to now flock and get trained. Remember, patients who have chronic medical conditions are the ones who rarely come for well adult checkups, right? They keep coming in about their hypertension, their diabetes, they don't come in for well visits. And because of the new PAP guidelines, reproductive age women are usually coming in, what, every three to five years for a PAP. Or they're not even coming to you because they don't see you for the PAP smear. So we're missing opportunities to counsel about contraception. So what I'm asking you is with your reproductive age women to include pregnancy intention as a vital sign. In other words, ask your patients, what are your intentions for pregnancy? If they're sexually active and if they're women who have sex with men and they don't want to get pregnant in the next year, and especially if having an unintended pregnancy, in other words, getting pregnant before they desire, would have significant quality of life Implications like, oh my God, my parents will disown me, I'll have to drop out of school, I'll, have to, I'll lose my job. Those are patients I want you to counsel LARC down. What do we traditionally do? We counsel pill up. 
Why? Because it takes me 30 seconds on my EMR to order Sprint Tech, right? But I will tell you that may not be the best fit. And studies show that if providers counsel in those particular patients, lark down, talk about IUDs and implants first, patients tend to be more amenable, they tend to use them more, they tend to continue them, and we see significant declines in unintended pregnancy rates in those patients. There are patients forget half of what you tell them in the office, right, as soon as they walk out the door. So there are nice handouts that the CDC has both in English and Spanish to help circle which, um, which contraceptive devices may be most appropriate for them so they could read more about it. So what's the take home? Unintended pregnancy, I hope I've convinced you, is a major public health problem. And if you take care of reproductive age women in your practice, it's certainly a major issue for you, especially your women who have cardiometabolic risk. And I hope you will take assess pregnancy intention as a vital sign in your office. Please help me dispel myths about contraception. Keep up to date about the latest benefits and safety and efficacy of different contraceptive methods. What are some of the new methods? And try to use that point of care tool, USME, whether it's you millennials on the, uh, with an app or whether you use it on paper. And I think you'll find it very helpful as a guide for your patients. And with that, I hope you'll consider IUG's first line for most of your reproductive age women. Just as a take home, I talked about the USMEC. There's also the US Selected Practices. It also comes as an app. It's a nice guide, like if I'm gonna start the patient on the ring, what are some things I need to know? And most things it tells you is you don't have to wait till a woman's period to start any method of contraception. But if you're not providing IUDs, what can I do when I don't know anybody who does? You can have your patient make them aware about Bedsider. It's a great app, it's a great website. They could put in their um, zip code and it will show them what providers in their area do provide LARC methods. And also the managing contraception and contraceptive technology are great little tools for you to have in your book. So I hope you all agree that life is sexually transmitted. You'll adopt the philosophy that every child should be a wanted one.